Hello, there we are. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel on the ethics of mining and development. Mm. My name is Eva Salinas. I am the managing editor here at the Canadian International Council and our website, Open Canada. Um, so to hello to every uh, reader and viewer who's watching live on the website now um, and on social media. Uh, before I welcome our three fantastic panelists today, I want to say that uh, this, this panel in part was uh, inspired by um, some recent discussions and features that have appeared in, in Canadian media and, and, and ongoing discussions. Um, most recently in the Toronto Star ran a three-part series looking at some brand new partnerships over the past couple of years anyway uh, between the Canadian government and the private sector um, mining companies in the facilitation of aid programs. Um, meanwhile, just last week, the Canadian government was pushing its uh, corporate social responsibility strategy at PDAC, which is the annual mining convention here in Toronto. Um, they announced a new CSR councillor, for instance, uh, for a position that had been vacant since the end of uh, 2013, and the initiative itself is only a few years old. Um, so it brings up a, a, a few questions and an interesting discussion around the ethics of uh, these new partnerships of, of mining and community development in general and on uh, CSR. So I'm really pleased to have these three panelists join us for this discussion and we want to welcome questions and comments online. Um, if you're following please use uh, the Twitter hashtag CIC Mining and uh, we'll take a few questions towards the end. So without further ado I will welcome our three guests today. Um, the first is Bob Fowler who uh, has worked for many, many years in the public service as a foreign policy advisor to several prime ministers. Um, he has, uh, he was the long, Canada's longest serving ambassador to the United Nations and he currently sits on the advisory board uh, for CSR for Barrett Gold. So welcome Bob. Thank you very much Eva. Uh, Meg French is also with us and she leads UNICEF's international programming which involves policy and, and advocacy work around child rights and the mining sector and um, has done a, a lot of advocacy work uh, on those issues. So welcome Meg. Thank you. And last but not least we have Josh Scheinert who is a, specializes in international human rights law and trade and the intersection of the two uh, and welcome Josh. Thanks. So I want to put the, the first question to you Bob. Um, and that's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a general question that often comes up when we have discussions around CSR and, and how much uh, of it uh, is an effort, when I'm speaking to the Canadian government specifically, an effort to promote Canadian companies abroad and how much of it is part of this larger movement uh, for more responsible mining. Well, I, I doubt if I could give you any, you asked me how much, so I can't give you proportions or percentages. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was a Canadian public servant for 40 years and mostly a diplomat, and I spent an awful lot of time promoting Canadian interests abroad, including Canadian investment and, mm -hmm. and Canadian products and Canadian expertise. Um, the fact that the government is doing that now in slightly different ways uh, is not surprising, nor in my mind um, is it is it uh, negative. Um, uh, I, I think there is perhaps a discussion to be had about um, the uh, the seriousness with which the government of Canada takes um, a rapidly evolving um, international discipline with regard to. Uh, human rights and business practices in the human rights context. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that this is something that is very much in evolution. Uh, personally, I would like to see the Canadian government take a much more forthright position um, with regard to um, the variety of emerging codes of conduct and guidelines that are out there and are constantly being elaborated. I would like to see Canada in a leadership position in those areas. I would like to see Canada more closely attuned with what we used to call in the UN context, the like-minded. That is the Nordics and the, and the Dutch and um, sometimes the Germans, uh, sometimes the Brits, 
um, uh, in a much more aggressively forceful protection of human rights generally across the board uh, um, uh, in areas that are looking into corporate social responsibility. So um, that said, the government is doing things. I would certainly wish that the um, uh, that the government had been a signatory to, for instance, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Uh, we're not even a, an implementing country, and I would wish it were otherwise. Hmm. Uh, that said, the government is spending an awful lot of money um, uh, promoting uh, uh, the purposes of EITI um, and um, keeps sort of edging towards becoming a more important player in that and with regard to the application of uh, UN uh, guiding principles and, and other codes of conduct. Mm -hmm. So it's very much, I think, a work in pro progress. And, and you asked me about the Canadian government, so that's what I've been talking about. In many, in many contexts in the CSR uh, area, I think um, the private companies and major companies are in advance of the government in terms of the commitments they're making and the activities uh, they are engaging in uh, throughout the world. Hmm. Well, Josh, you were at PDAC last week and you saw a lot of those private companies, uh, the discussions anyway that they were having um, around CSR and community development. Uh, what, did, what were your takeaways from PDAC? Um, you know, obviously CSR is part of a, a larger discussion around um, human rights and environmental rights and did you feel that uh, within the private sector they were connecting those dots uh, or, or was there any disconnect there? There was some disconnect. Um, last week at PDAC we heard from a number of people in the industry, all very well intentioned people, um, I believe with a strong commitment to corporate social responsibility, um, growing a more positive track record for the extractive industries in terms of their levels of community engagement and community relations, but where a gap exists, in my opinion, is between appreciating CSR from the community perspective and then CSR from the international legal perspective, from the overarching legal frameworks uh, that set out norms, set out definitions of what human rights entail, I mean, it's all well and good for a corporation to pay respect to local customs and local traditions and ensure that they're going about their business that makes the community happy in that respect. But when we talk about human rights, we're talking about legal terms that come with legal definitions and they bestow a certain set of rights um, towards individuals and communities. And if we fail to appreciate the extent to which rights from a legal perspective um, can interact with this, and I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. I gave the example last week that in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights has held that to right to, the right to life can be infringed um, if foreseeable harm arises from mistreatment of toxins at garbage dumps. And we're talking about mining companies, um, everyone in the extractive sector is pulling things out of the ground and using chemicals and there's a lot of toxins and a lot of dirty things that need to be stored in place and appreciating that there's a legal side to human rights that can have far-reaching effects on notions that might not necessarily at first engage with what they're doing on the ground I think cheats them from an ability to uh, ch cheats them from the opportunity of truly appreciating their obligations in this area. Thanks, Josh. Um, Meg, UNICEF has an interesting um, role in um, the intersection here between um, these legal obligations and um, your mandate. Um, and you know, when when do you partner officially with communities versus the private sector? You, with the advocacy work, I guess maybe first let's start with what what have uh, what has UNICEF been doing um, with the private sector to to advance uh, child rights in, in in mining. So <coughs> UNICEF um, 
I mean, it is it is a decision to make. I mean, in terms of who you partner with, and um, and, and so the decisions to work with the extractive sector, um, and and I wouldn't put it as the community versus the extractive extractive uh, company in terms of the decision you have to make. You you want to be working with both, um, but really, what guides the work we do. Um, is the best interest of children. So that's the guiding principle through which we make decisions about who we are going to partner with um, and any of the work that we do um, in, in our work around the world. Um, and so when it comes to working with the private sector and when it comes with, to working with the extractive sector in, in particular, um, we're working through a set of principles called the Children's Rights and Business Principles. Um, and so these principles were launched about three years ago and they set up um, a series of different principles that companies should be looking at that extend across the, work, the workplace, the marketplace, the community, and the environment. Um, and what they do is ask companies to use a child rights lens in their work, in assessing their practices, in assessing their policies. And so that's the work that we've been doing with the sector, um, is to, to show companies that they're working in some of the most vulnerable communities in the world. Um, and the work they do has an impact on children. And it can be a negative impact, but it can be a positive impact as well. And if they use the children's rights and business principles, if they take this children's rights lens and they look at their practices, if they look at their grievance mechanisms, if they look at um, their stakeholder engagement, their social investment, um, their environmental practices through a children's rights lens, um, they can identify where they're having a negative impact on kids and where there's the possibility to also have a positive impact and support their rights. And, and so that's, that's the guiding, that's the, what guides what we do. And what kind of response have you had from the sector? So we've had a really positive response from the sector. I think particularly in Canada, um, I think Canadian companies are really looking at um, how their work is, has a broader impact um, on the environment around them, on the communities around them, um, and not just at the site level, but nationally as well. Um, and so we've had um, interest in companies on the children's rights and business principles, um, and we've been working uh, with some companies here in Canada on looking at grievance mechanisms. And we've done um, uh, some human rights impact assessments that involve children's rights. Um, and we have companies that have started making decisions about their social investment based on the best interest of children and how they can have the biggest impact. Um, and what we see with that is that um, it is, it's supportive of the work we do. Um, and so the, the communities that we work with and the governments that we work with for that matter, um, I mean, not to say that that you know everybody thinks that, that this is the right direction um, for the work that we're doing, um, but what is behind the decision to work is, is a good, strong set of values about the best interest of children. Um, and so that motivator really helps support our decision to work with the extractive companies because we need to work with everybody who has impact on children. We all have a responsibility to make a difference for kids, no matter whether or not we're governments, individuals, so, uh, civil society, or the private sector. And so as UNICEF, as the agency responsible for children's rights, we know that we have a responsibility to work with the mining sector to make sure that they keep the best interest of children in mind as well. Has that risked at all any of UNICEF's um, impartiality on the ground, say the, the view from the community's point of view? We haven't had um, any negative response. Okay. Um, not to say it won't or can't happen, um, but at this point, um, we've really seen uh, support for the work that we're doing, both um, from communities, the government, and companies themselves. Great. And Bob, hearing some of these partnerships, but also Meg mentioned, um, you know, the ability now or the different mechanisms that are coming up for grievances. How have you seen the evolution of these? Um, of the movement overall, but also um, the ways in which uh, we can hold either governments or, or um, companies responsible? Are they working? Are, are they growing? Do you see this as a stronger movement, say, compared to 15 years ago when the Kimberley process even was coming out and these talks were happening at a larger level? Well, um, Eva, I think, I, I, as I told you, I spent my whole life sort of um, 
in and around multilateral diplomacy, and usually things move at a pretty glacial pace mm -hmm. um, in trying to develop new norms of behavior and and principles and guidelines. And I, I, I am I am amazed at what has happened. Not not over the last 15 years, but over the last five years even, it is remarkable. As Josh um, and Meg have said, I mean, there is now an open, active um, cooperation, not just dialogue among civil society, the private sector and governments to, to achieve um, viable norms and guidelines in this area. And, and from my perspective, that dialogue has been remarkably non-acrimonious, remarkably cooperative. Now, I'm not saying there aren't um, difficult issues and that there aren't people who would not view the dialogue the way I've just presented it. But I think most people, most players in the business from all three sectors, civil society, um, business and government, would would agree that um, remarkable progress has been made. I, I have the privilege of working with an old pal of mine, John Ruggie, who is a Canadian who, who is at Harvard and spent 10 years at the UN, and he's the guy who developed the, the guiding principles um, for, for business uh, uh, on human rights. And, and he, he, uh, he presented his findings only uh, four years ago, and already they are in, in conjunction with other guidelines, most of them older, uh, they are having a significant impact. Uh, in, in his guidelines, he engaged some of the issues um, um, Josh was raising a moment ago. I mean, specifically, um, the whole dialogue between governments and business was, was gummed up, was slowed down for a long time on the issue of who was responsible for monitoring human rights. Um, and, the, and the business side said, wait a minute, human rights are fundamentally a government responsibility. And, and uh, some governments in the world said, yeah, but uh, citing the kinds of examples Josh mentioned a moment ago, uh, that certainly doesn't absolve business from responsibilities in those same areas. And I agree completely. Uh, so John's principles basically um, state that there is a fundamental duty on the part of governments to protect human rights, that there is a corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and there is a significantly greater need to establish formal guidelines for remedies for victims um, uh, who accuse businesses of violating human rights. And I think it's within that broad guideline that we're all working. And one of the challenges, um, you know, that that is re very related to that is the complexity of the supply chain in the mining sector. Um, and um, this, you know, becomes even more crucial uh, for communities who who live in a conflict zone or, um, you know, where the, where sometimes responsibility in the past, anyway, um, although it's still ongoing, can be passed off. Um, and we see initiatives um, such as the Fairphone, um, which is this phone that's being developed, that has been developed um, in Europe, um, that um, tries to be as transparent as possible with its supply chain and um, tracing all the way to the most responsibly mined um, resources out of the Congo. Um, so, Josh, I guess when we speak to um, supply chain issues, I have, have, is there a legal framework um, that can actually tie a company to, um, you know, somewhere that uh, if they're working with, say, a, a, um, an armed group or a, a group um, in a conflict zone that can tie them, you know, three or four spots down the supply chain from them? Sure. Um, we're seeing it right now play out in uh, Canadian courts here in Ontario. There are Indigenous peoples out of Guatemala who are suing a Canadian minerals company, Hud Bay Minerals, uh, for negligence for uh, alleged human rights abuses committed by security forces that were employed by Hud Bay and not by Hud Bay individuals uh, themselves. 
And when you read the pleadings, um, it's alleged that HUD Bay knew or ought to have known the extent to which uh, criminality or, or wrongdoing was A, going on, and B, foreseeable to continue under uh, the group that they had partnered with. And HUD Bay had uh, attempted to have um, the case struck out, um, and that was rejected um, by the Ontario courts. So that will proceed, and just that loss on the motion to strike the pleadings is a significant step forward in uh, letting corporations know that notwithstanding the corporate structure, you can um, be responsible for subsidiaries, for contractors, for people you connect with on the ground. And I think as this develops, we'll see people borrowing a lot from the doctrine of international criminal law where you have this idea of command responsibility where it's argued that commanders cannot absolve themselves for the wrongdoings of their troops, of people who fall under their command no matter how far beneath them. You know, it's, the buck has to stop somewhere and you can't hide behind the corporate veil uh, forever. And with the growth of the Ruggie framework and its endorsement and the voluntary principles being endorsed um, by more and more governments and international organizations, the idea that everyone is supportive of human rights and corporate, greater corporate social responsibility will help judiciaries and plaintiffs um, put forward these arguments that, that argue that parent corporations need to be held responsible because, look, they've come out and endorsed the Ruggie framework. The Canadian government has their CSR and the Extractive Industries uh, program and individual that they've appointed to oversee this. So how can you now argue that notwithstanding that HUD Bay or it doesn't need to be HUD Bay, it's everyone picks on them because they're the ones in the court now, but that X corporation headquartered in, let's see, the new provinces and say Calgary, you know, why are you, you can't absolve them because they've come out publicly and their government has come out publicly and said, look, we support this type of behavior and well, now we're not going to hold them accountable just because it was someone they signed a contract with to act on their behalf that was, in fact, violating those principles and not the people in their office tower uh, downtown. I'm wondering if part of it, I mean, it is changing, but most of coverage of mining companies still happens within the business sections of our newspapers, um, you know, from an economic point of view. And, Meg, you, you do you know, essentially with your advocacy work, you know, part of it must be um, storytelling and, and painting the picture that, you know, has that uh, more um, overall look at the situation. Where do you find uh, gaps, if there are any, uh, when you're relating these issues on um, the obligations that companies have, um, the rights that communities have? Um, and it, are those gaps different when whether you're speaking with the private sector or, say, versus your donors and the general public? Um, there are differences, but there's similarities. I think that the um, what what is missing in, in overall in the understanding is the interconnectedness uh, between social development and, and sustainable development and sustainable mining, um, and how those two things are, are intersect. I think um, when it comes to uh, children in particular, um, you often, the response from, from anybody is usually, you know, to think first of all of child labor. Um, and so there are a lot of other rights issues um, that are encompassed when we talk about children in mining. And so getting people to understand um, from a, a public side that children in mining doesn't just mean violations of rights. That there's there that the that the mining sector um, can bring positive benefits to children and communities is a gap that needs to be filled. And on the flip side, um, I think mining companies also need to understand that children aren't completely separate from the work that they do. That they do have an impact on that work, and that there are benefits to them of focusing on children and mining. And, and supporting on the and, and looking at the rights of children. Um, I think uh, that 
it's going to take action. I think it, it needs real examples, more and more building on each other to show uh, the, the potential. Um, to show one that companies are serious um, about looking at the work that they're doing um, so that communities see the see that um, and and understand um, that they're starting to make a commitment to really address human rights violations but also that they understand um, their role in the community and their role as global citizens as well um, and I think that on the flip side for companies it's really about saying look at your the life of a mind runs for a generation of children. You're watching a generation of children grow. And these, this is the generation of children that will be your future employees, that will be the future community leaders. Um, you know, this is the strength of the community. This is the strength of the nation, nation that you're investing in. Um, and if you start focusing on children's rights now, making sure not to violate their rights, but also to support their rights, you're going to help with risk mitigation. You're going to help build your, your reputation, your enhanced reputation, and you're going to have a motivated workforce who sees that you value them and their children in the community that they're in. So there's really a benefit to everyone if we can really understand that there will be challenges and there is work to do, um, but that there is potential there for such good. Mm -hmm. And I think that that um, echoes a lot of the arguments that, you know, it can be a win-win situation that, you know, it's in everyone's interests. Um, but I guess the the tricky part uh, comes often comes down to is um, whose interests come first, and and whether the other interests are um, just to you know appease those interests, or or whether there's there's a genuine um, effort to to ensure that uh, all interests are met. And I, I want to give the last word to you, Bob. Um, just we we did have a question come up, just very general on, on CSR and, and, and whether it is um, genuine, I guess. Um, and I'm wondering how we evaluate then um, if, if there's multiple narratives often coming from the company, from the government, from um, activists and communities on the ground, um, how do we evaluate those narratives or, and um, find you know, what, what is working? Well, I mean, it's an extremely complicated question you're asking, and I think the short answer is we don't have the answer to it. In other words, there is not yet, you know, the the, the perfect matrix, the, the the wonderful template that we can apply across the board to extractive industries working in extremely different different circumstances all over the world. Um, that said, uh, transparency is the name of the game. And um, companies are being and should be held accountable, uh, not only to do the right thing out there, but to make clear that they are doing the right thing. And in their publications and in their public appearances, to be held accountable to these emerging standards. Um, we, have, we, have, we have thousands of companies in Canada operating around the world some very, very small ones, some middle-sized ones, and some huge ones. Um, very often, the activities of a very minor company can garner a whole bunch of attention and sort of smear the industry. Uh, and standards are changing very quickly, um, and from my perspective, very happily. Um, so that we are getting towards those templates, those standards, those guidelines. We're not there that transparency must be the, the name of the game. And with transparency, I think we'll get the kind of um, holding to account that you're looking for. But uh, allow me even just to make uh, uh, he would, wouldn't the uh, kind of Pollyanna-ish comment at the end here, saying let, let us not forget that we Canadians live in a very fortunate and happy country, essentially founded on the extractive industries, founded by foreign direct investors from Europe investing in a resource economy which is ours and we've done okay by it. Um, the, the official development assistance which many people in this business continue to uh, focus upon as the fundamentally essential vehicle for development. Um, and, and I, for one, am constantly castigating our government for being insufficiently generous. 
uh, with respect to ODA um, for lapsing hundreds of millions of dollars each year in a declining ODA budget um, uh, in, in a situation where measured against our peers, we really don't look very good. That said, other aspects of financial flows to developing countries are vastly more important. Uh, the most important among them is direct foreign investment. Mm. And in most cases, uh, because they are developing economies, direct foreign investment goes into the extractive sectors. But that's what's creating economic activity in developing countries. That's what's generating jobs and generating tax revenue, which allow governments to govern. Right. Um, well, lots to think about here. and. Um, I'm sure this is a topic we will continue to discuss uh, on OpenCanada.org, but um, with uh, fu future features, um, guest contributions down the road. Um, so thank you so much to the three of you uh, for joining us today and to all of our readers and viewers who have joined us online, and we look forward to the next one. Thanks again. Thanks, Eva. Thank you. Thank you.